Now, as we continue to celebrate Women's Month here in Afro Bold View, today we take a closer look at some of the issues affecting women across the country, paying special focus on the issue of gender-based violence against women. And this evening, joining me in studio is Busa Buntu, who is the founder of the Busa Buntu Pictures, as well as Natalie Abrahams, who is author, motivational speaker, and activist against gender-based violence. Ladies, thank you so much for your time and for joining us in our program this evening yeah. we just marked you know women's month in the country and i'm sure you will agree with me when i say that it is really has been no cause of concern for celebration it's really just you know no celebrations at all for women in the country and we've seen this month actually starting on a very interesting note to where we've seen scores of women across the country saying that enough is enough just talk us through a little bit more about your experiences about gender-based violence in the country knowing very well that you have both been very much vocal on the issue of gender-based violence in in the, in the country i'll actually start off with you natalie and move over to you thank you good evening south africa and viewers um i think one of the biggest problems that we have is in 2016 there were there was one woman killed every eight hours. Two years later, we are one woman every four hours. That is a concern for our country. Um, I've just literally come back from Limpopo where I hosted my first conference for Women's Month. I'll be hosting four conferences. And I was up until half past four this morning speaking to women from all over South Africa. Abuse is out there. It's real. Um, I had doctors. I had psychologists. I had... Um, I had women that were running their own businesses attend my conferences and after speaking to them in person I realized that abuse affects us all. Mm -hmm. No one is excluded from abuse and one of the things that we know is that our justice system does not support the struggle that we have at the moment. Our justice system is not equipped mm -hmm. to, to support the problem that we face at the moment. Women are afraid to speak up because when they speak up, where do they go from there? Mm. What help is provided to them after they have spoken up? Mm. Let's actually talk a little bit more about that. So, you know, now that as a country we can actually stand up and say that, you know, abuse is real, rape is real, you know, the injustices against women in the country, they're real. Yeah. We're seeing these real life stories with people actually even coming up and saying that, I'm a, you know, a victim of, of abuse, so I'm a survivor of rape. However, though, you know, a lot of women still are very reluctant with the issue of actually coming out. Let's talk about the resources available to women when they find themselves in a situation where they're facing abuse or have been raped, especially by their partners. I think it's really such an important um, structure that Natalie touched on and that we're trying to discover here. When you have been raped, and even if the court finds the person guilty, that's a four-year process that a lot of young women have to go through. So imagine you've gone through this trauma of being sexually violated, and then you have to deal with your community, first and foremost, shaming you or doubt. Because I think that's what women and young men who do deal with sexual violence face first, doubt. Oh, no, it was your fault. What were you wearing? What did you say to invite him? So then you have that community structure, and then you get to... A judicial structure where you're thinking to yourself do I want to put myself through this mm. for four years do I want to be triggered constantly um, and obviously with the Me Too movement we're seeing that the media is actually it's a catch-22 because the media can assassinate victims or it can be a platform that victims can use to be heard and to make it uncomfortable for sexual predators to be in the workspace mm. so there are resources but it's definitely it needs mm. to be beefed up mm. we need more you know one of our guests was supposed to be a clinical psychologist and i think that they might actually join us a bit later on mm. um, with our discussion however i think you know it's a question that actually all of us as women we continue asking ourselves as to what is wrong with men you know, what could actually be the reason where we're actually seeing this entire scourge of social ills in the country where men just feel so entitled to women's bodies? Natalie, with you. You know, I actually <laughs> spoke about that this weekend. And I think the biggest problem that we have is we had this march that said women needs to be liberated. And women were emancipated and men felt that my position is being threatened. 
And over the years, we have seen women evolve in business, in, you know, in their careers as mothers. And men are intimidated by women. And, you know, we've reached a, I would say we've reached an era where women can do things for themselves. And they don't depend on men. And that is where we make a mistake as women. Um, my message for this year's conference is I am a woman. I am dependently independent. So I'm independent. I run my own business. I can do a lot of things. But I need you as a man to be my husband. I need you as my boyfriend to protect me. I need you to understand that I have my own opinion. I have my own dream. I have my own vision that needs to be aligned with yours. And I think what's happening is we are misunderstood as women. And um, the perception is that women want to be out there and they want to own the world. We don't want to own the world. We don't want to rule the world. You know, we want to make a difference. We want to be heard, but we also want to be protected. We want to be cared for. We want to be loved. We want to be nurtured, you know, and by our men. And I actually spoke to one of my guests this weekend and she was raped two years ago. And she said to me, you are the first person that I'm telling besides my best friend that I called that night to take me to the hospital. Mm. Why have you not spoken up? Because it's someone that is known to my family. Mm. Because my family is well known in the community. What is my father going to say? What is the community going to say? Mm. What is my brother going to do? Mm. That's actually, you know, I actually wanted to also get your viewpoint on that. But looking at actually time constraints, I need to really ask this question. But, uh, you know, looking at the role played, of course, by our churches, our families, when it comes to issues of gender-based violence, it, it may actually seem that uh, they, they're actually, you know, encouraging the oppressor's, you, you know, you know, behavior mm -hmm. and not that of the victim. Because as you've made mention that uh, people are very much, women are very much scared to speak out on issues of, of rape and, and, and abuse and violence in a sense that I'm scared that I'm going to be judged not only by my friends, not only by my family, but as well as in the church, which is supposedly, you know, supposed to be a, a, a place of, of safety, mm -hmm. which has once been a cornerstone, you know, for many of us growing up, you know, and still living. What, what's your take on that? I think just um, to combine your previous question and this answer, I think it's not men who are terrible. I think it's the identity of masculinity that's in crisis because I don't think it helps us to isolate men from our feminist movement. We need them, like Natalie was saying and you're saying, we need them as a part of this rural community and that's why we feel disappointed by our institutes because they have made the silence. Silence is the tool that's helped sexual predators keep their jobs. Mm. If in a church you abuse a child and then you just get moved to a different district that child is traumatized and violated but you still have your job you can still hurt people and I think that these institutes these traditional institutes whether it's churches whether it's government whether it's our home because our home is an institute need to look at how we're teaching our young boys to look at themselves and look at women and across the board we just need to start having a conversation where we're taking a collective responsibility for the crisis in masculinity but also pointing out that it is men who are being violent to other men too and men who are being violent to womanhood so I, I try not to separate because I am a true mm. feminist I try not to separate men from the dialogue mm. um, I think the hashtag men are trash is a response to the violence and it's warranted but I think that if men who are also lost in this dialogue and are trying to figure out how to help and how how to be our ally, closing the door in their face is not going to help. Mm -hmm. It's saying you need to start listening, you need to start talking less and you need to stand by a woman when she says she's been violated. Mm -hmm. And if she says she was just tapped on the bum, that's, a, that's not a small thing. Stand by her mm -hmm. and maybe that will start changing the culture because it's a cultural ill that we and, face. And your take, Natalie, on that, you know, you know, especially at grassroots level, mm. especially when young, you know, when boys are still young, yeah. when do we actually start involving them in, in conversations such as these? I believe from the youngest age possible. My husband actually wrote a book um, and, you know, he speaks from a man's point of view about issues that affect. And... One of the things he writes in his book is that, you know, your upbringing as a boy um, really affects how you behave in your marriage and in your relationships. Mm -hmm. And what we are teaching our boys is that be a man, don't cry, don't show emotions. And then they get into relationships when they are older and they have been told not to show emotion. Yeah. And, you know, just touching on the, the church issue, I'm very involved in, in church. Mm -hmm. 
And the honest truth is that they do not know how to deal with the crisis. Yeah. They are not trained to deal yeah. with the crisis. You know, have we have pastors that have been trained to teach the word mm -hmm. and to bring people to disciple them into the kingdom of God. And now the church has become the hospital for everything. And the pastors are not trained to deal with trauma. They are not trained to mm -hmm. deal with a, an abusive man. You know, mm -hmm. so in the church's defence, you know. It's not their responsibility mm. alone, and, and they, I, they cannot... And now, without interrupting you, Lena, <laughs> looking at the narrative that uh, a lot of women, they grow up knowing that uh, I can't dress a certain way, yeah. I can't, you know, walk down the streets, you know, past 8 p.m., or as soon as it gets dark outside, I cannot walk. And just last night, scrolling past on, on social media, on Twitter, um, a lot of women were actually talking about the issue of how I try not to get raped. Yeah. How do I prevent myself from finding myself in a sticky situation where I'm abused, I'm raped, or I'm murdered? Yeah. Now, how do we carry on this conversation to our young girls? Not only running away from the fact that abuse is still there, mm -hmm. even if I say my child don't walk down the street, it's still, you know, an issue that's going to happen. But now how do we rope in, you know, those kind of conversations directed to our young girls on issues of you can dress how you want to dress, but you still need to be very cautious of, you know, a problem such as being raped on the streets. Your take on that? I think, first of all, it's your body, it's your choice. So that's what we teach young girls and young boys. And our young girls just need to know that like you said, it is a reality. There is a rape culture that exists, but that they shouldn't carry that responsibility. However they dress, however they carry themselves, that's not the problem. The problem is in a sexual predator thinking that he can do that to you. And it's shifting that education where young girls are taught to be safe in the streets, but it's not um, something that we should keep teaching them to believe is their fault. And that's been our problem, I think, for so long, is that we as women are made to feel like we caused this. Oh, you wore a mini skirt. And I don't want to tell my future daughters that they have to dress a certain way. Why can't I tell that to my mm. sons too? You know, if I'm not going to tell it to my sons, I'm not going to tell it to my daughters. We need to come together and really assess how we communicate rape culture to young people. Mm. Mm. Your, your, your take on that? Absolutely. Exactly. I agree 100%. Um, I believe, I mean, this weekend there was women walking around in bikinis and I was like, oh my goodness. And you know, they just own their bodies. Yes. And you know, they, they, as women, we should embrace our bodies and we should feel proud of it. And it gives no other human being the mm. right to violate. Absolutely. Mm. Let's quickly look at the role played by the government mm. when it comes to the introduction of uh, campaigns of making people aware of issues such as these and actually curbing these social ills, you know, facing women in the country. And also the role played by law enforcement officials. The law actually kind of at the current moment seems to be on the favor or favoring um, the oppressor or the, you know, people who are, you know, the abusers or the rapists or the murderers. And so many times you listen to people telling their stories of abuse and they're like, I tried to call the police, they never acted on it. And that seems to be one of the, you know, reigning narratives where people are like, I try calling the police, they never help me, they never help me. They say, you can fix it at home, you can fix it at home. Can they actually do better? Should they actually do better? Natalie, I'll start with you and come over to you, Busa. Sure. I, I had a personal experience with that. And the issue, once again, is are they really equipped to deal with this matter? Um, I spoke to somebody last week who said to me that they contacted the police and the policeman said, well, once he's beaten her, call us then because currently we don't have a van to go oh. out. So I believe that the justice system together with the resources that are out there, the shelters, the NGOs, the churches, everybody needs to come together. Every organization plays a role. There is no single organization or institute within South Africa that can handle the whole problem. We need to break down the problem and we need to see who can handle which facet of the problem mm. and they need to take responsibility for that. Now I actually have quite you know a little bit of seconds to actually salvage in, in our conversation. I actually <laughs> wish we had you know so much more time to actually speak on this but how when do we move away from the tables? 
of discuss, dis, you know, discussing the issue of gender-based violence. There's only so much talking we can do. Yeah. How do we intensify this struggle then to really make our voices heard? Because I feel like the more and more we, 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 we're just, you know, kind of just glued around the tables now where we're like, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. But is there any other way that we can actually intensify the struggle? I start off, I'll start off with you, Busa. Um, I, I'm really fortunate in that I have a civic uh, duty through the Film and Publication Board as a council member to be in a position where I was going to answer your question on law. I don't think law supports the oppressors. I think, like Natalie said, there's some loopholes and we need to support them as a community. So I would say to young people and to women, galvanize yourselves, come together as communities, go to your local NGOs, go to your local churches, call them out, say to them, mm. listen, there was abuse here and I want you as my pastor to come with me and together we'll mm. make it happen. And seek out your ministers, mm. tweet them. You know, we have digital systems now that allow for you to say, hey, listen, why is the regulation around sexual violence still so poor? Mm. Why are you not showing up for us? And they'll listen because you're mm. calling them out. And now, Natalie, two seconds, just words of encouragement for, a, you know, a, a woman watching our television this, you know, this evening um, who is, you know, in a very abusive relationship yeah. or is a victim or a survivor of rape in, the, in, in that case. First of all, abuse kills. Um, speak up, find somebody that's going to listen to you and that's going to support you. Um, in terms of rape, all I can say is it's never your fault. Mm. It is never your fault. Mm. There are organizations out there, there are people out there. You're and to the people that support, I want to say, when you support, support all the way. Mm. Don't give up along the journey. Mm. Well, Natalie and Bose, thank you so much, ladies, for your time and for joining us on our program this yes. evening. Uh, well, on that note, it's time now to take a short break. Stay tuned for more news and updates right here on Afro World View.